Well, here we are. As you can possibly tell, I'm outside. But you possibly can see here the sundial. This is what the clock used to have before 1610. And that's the only thing we could use to uh, tell the time. The clock tower, it's up there in the dark. What I'm going to do now is to wander up there. Now, I may lose signal. If I do, then Paul will uh, control the cameras. I'm walking the uh, staircase. Looks like I might have lost the signal. I'm going upstairs and I'll meet you up at the top of the tower in a second, going up the narrow stair. It's about 60 or 70 steps. There we go. I'll take my mask off now and climb up up here and uh, I'll go and get the microphone which is sitting here and I'll plug that onto myself. Pretty cold up here. Heating hasn't been on for a while. Let me turn this around so I can see what's going on. Right. You've got various views here. Just to give you an idea of what the, the layout is, I've got a, a camera up here which is pointing over to the clock. I've got my phone. I've got a third camera which I can use if I need it down here. And I've got a fourth camera which is over, over there. Now, Paul um, has... Um, Paul Ashley is in charge of all the, all the cameras and he's going to try and make sense of what I'm doing. Well, let me first give you a little bit of an introduction about the clock. I'm just going to share my screen for a second and tell you about the Trinity College clock. This is an interesting picture to look at because... If you, you might wonder why on earth would anyone put such a big dial on this tower? It's kind of cutting into the stonework. It's covering the window of the room below. Well, I don't believe it was ever intended to, to last. If you look directly above the clock dial of where the 60 is, you can still see a little bit of decorative stonework. That is where I think the original clock dial was. That original clock dial, which was put up on our clock tower in 1610, is currently in the Orwell Village Church. And it was removed and replaced by what we have at present. And you can see in the diagram in the middle. It was removed in 1726. Um, and it was... Uh, Thomas Bentley, the then master, who insisted on having uh, the, uh, this big dial. Uh, Thomas Bentley, I think, was the 18th century Donald Trump. He was um, always got his own way, managed to stay as master for 40 years, even though nobody wanted him to stay. Fingers crossed that doesn't happen. Um, but that's more or less what happened. Um, so you can see then that from 1610, we went from the little clock dial to the big one. And then in 1910, the mechanism which is behind me now was installed. It's the third clock that's been in this tower, but the dial was left um, unchanged. I really do believe that the original clock dial went up above this new one new 1726 and that the fellows at the time had every intention once Bentley left died assassinated whatever might have happened that they will put the um, the old dial back well here we are um, 
um, nearly uh, 300 years later, maybe we could, um, we could put the old dial back. Well, look, let's have a, let's have a look at the, um, uh, at the mechanism. I'm going to use my phone over here, turn it around, and show you a few things. Well, the first thing to notice about this mechanism is that it's divided up into four bits. In the middle is the most important bit. It's the bit that does the ticking. And there's a pendulum that swings below. The pendulum is, a, it's a, a three second period. So it ticks every one and a half seconds. And we can see that every one and a half seconds, this uh, escapement goes around and uh, it, well, that's the timekeeping part of the clock. And there's various gears that turn around and, and so on. And the idea is that you want to turn the hands on the clock dial. Well, here is the second hand. That dial there is the second hand. You can see it ticking. It ticks actually, one, it moves every one and a half seconds. So it's a one and a half second hand. And then there's the minute hand. And that's telling us that we're currently, can't mean to read it. It's coming, coming up to um, 40 minutes past the hour. And on this particular clock here, there is no hour hand. So I can't tell really what the hour is. But the thing is that that second hand, it turns this shaft here, and that shaft goes out of the clock box, and it goes over here, and over here is a, is a box, what's going on here? Well, if I now get my torch out and show you what's going on in here, this, take that off, Take this off. If you look in there, you'll see the mechanism that drives the hands. There's a hole in the wall. That hole in the wall goes outside. And here we have a gear. And the gears are designed with a 12 to 1 gear reduction. So the minute hand is driven by the clock and the hour hand looks after itself. Now these things up here, those round sort of object things, those are balance weights. So this is the balance weight for the minute hand. And if anybody was looking outside at the moment, they'd see the minute hand, minute hand bouncing up and down. And there's the balance weight for the hour hand. And the idea is that the, well, the hands are pretty heavy, you need balance weights. Now, those balance weights are opposite to where the hands are, and they're more or less in the same position, and that's because the time is 20 to 8, so the minute hand and the hour hand are pretty much over each other. So that is the, where the um, time goes out the wall and uh, to the real world, and where it connects to the clock, well, we can follow that from the real world over to this lovely bevel gear and that bevel gear takes us back up into the clock where it connects to the minute hand. Right, that's the important bit, the bit that ticks, tells us the time. But over here on the left is a bit that rings bells, rings bells at quarter past the hour, half past the hour, three quarters and at the hour. And the bells that it rings go ding dong, that's quarter past. And then ding dong, ding dong, that's half past. And then ding dong, ding dong, ding dong, that's three quarters. And then four times at the hour. And the way that works is through these levers. There's a lever here and the lever there. And those levers move up and down. I'll show you them actually doing their work in a second. And those levers 
There are some wires that go out of the top of the clock box. And the wires, can you see them up there? Those wires go up here to the roof to where there are some more levers. And there are levers up there. And those levers go up through the roof and up to where the bells are. And the bells are up on the belfry. And it's a bit dangerous to go up there, especially at night. So I'm not going to go up there now. But they are the wires that pull, pull the bells. Now that's there on the left. And on the right are the bells for the hours. Now, you know, may know that the Trinity clock strikes the hour twice. So over on the left we get ding dong, ding dong, ding dong, ding dong. Then this one here gets going and strikes the hour, the so-called Trinity strike. Dong, 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 and it'll do eight times in a second. And then the next one strikes eight times. Dong, 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 eight times. And that's a St. John's strike. Now, if you look then at the clock overall, you'll get the impression that actually most of what's there is for ringing the bells. And that actually, it is the case that most of what you see there is for ringing the bells. That, after all, is the important thing for um, any clock, any tower clock, is to ring the bells. Because that's what you want to hear you, when you're in your supervision or when you're in bed or when you're, you're trying to figure out whether it's time for dinner, you want to be able to hear the bells. So that's why there's so much effort gone to make this uh, clock ring bells. Now, it's going to ring quarter to eight at quarter to eight. Um, the clock, though, is currently about eight or nine or ten seconds fast. I'll tell you a bit about that in, in, a, in, a, in a little while. But if we look at the second hand, the second hand there is going around, and that's telling me that there's about 30 seconds to go before it's going to strike quarter to eight. Now, if you've got your own accurate time, you'll know that it's, you'll be able to tell that it's about eight or ten seconds fast. But here we go, I'm going to show you. It's going to go in about 12 seconds. You'll be able to have a look at this mechanism spinning around and it's going to go, here we come, ready, and now. So the, the fly for the quarters is there to provide air resistance so that it doesn't run too fast. So you get a nice, gentle, measured pace. And the same is true for the hours, for the, for the Trinity strike and the St. John strike, which we'll hear at 8 o'clock. But the um, question you might ask is, why is it called the Trinity strike and why is it called the St. John strike? And the story goes that um, St. John's, when the tower was built uh, at St. John's, couldn't afford bells, and that uh, Trinity would ring the bells for St. John's. Well, there's been two strikes for long before the St. John's tower was built, so I'm not sure about the veracity of that. But still, any opportunity to have a dig at St. John's is fine, so let's just stick with that. Um, I think the true story is something more to do with on the continent, um, the, you would have bells that would ring um, uh, twice, so that if you're out in the field somewhere and you didn't quite know what the time was, and you heard the bells ringing, you could say, hey, shut up, everyone. Let's hear what the time is. Um, and that's quite a useful thing to do. But in, um, in England, the tradition was to have a preamble, like at Westminster, ding dong, ding dong. So you know to shut up, and then you can hear the bells. This clock here does, it, does both, which I guess is perverse. I don't know of any other clock that does that, but um, there we go. Um, now, one of the things that has to be done once a week 
is to wind the clock. I'm going to uh, I'm going to do that now, and I'm going to Paul can decide which um, which view he likes, but I'm going to put this camera down so that I've got my hands free. What I'm going to do. I, I'm sho I'm showing the uh, the broad view now. Okay. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up this uh, big handle, and uh, the handle's got a square hole in it, and there are four square pegs, which is where the winding happens. So this one is for the the quarters, and this one is pretty heavy. Wow. The heaviest one. Now, I'm going to turn the other camera over so you might be able to see the weights as they come up. And then we'll see them later on. But there is the heaviest of the weights coming up now. And it weighs about 160 kilograms, and it's quite a job to wind this going up. You might be able to see it going up in the distance, and I'm going to stop it about there. So you should be able to see, I think, the should be able to see the weights up there. A bit out of breath. I'm now going to wind another one. I'm going to wind the Trinity Strike. I've closed the door over there just so that you can see the weights. But here I go. I'm going to wind this one. This one weighs about 120 kilograms, I think. Oh, it's a bit lighter. And I don't know whether you can see the weights going up. Can you hear that? See that, Paul? I think. Yes, it's very clear to me. Here we go. And then once I've finished the, the Trinity. Wait, by the way, the clock was last wound on Monday. So it's only actually had sort of three days worth of use. Normally wound once every seven days. So actually, this is fairly easy. I'm only doing less than half a week's worth. Um, right. So I shouldn't complain. I've now got to do the St. John's strike. This one. Oh, this is lighter still. Oh, it's going a bit faster now. And uh, so that one is now, that's more or less as far as I need to go with that one. Okay. Now, what we have now. I look at my other camera is that the three weights are up the top. There is the heaviest one, a couple of lighter ones, but the third one, fourth one, still down here. A long way down there, it's about seven meters down. The fourth one is for the going, for the ticking. Now this one is quite interesting. And this is one of the most really clever things about this clock, which is that the, um, how do you wind the ticking if you need the weight to run the ticking? Now, most people don't care too much about this, that you might not uh, be bothered if you've got a grandfather clock if while you're winding it, the clock stops. Well, who cares? It's only going to take a few seconds to wind it. No one cares. 
this clock is accurate to perhaps a second a month. So it's really important that we don't stop the clock. Now, this is the clever thing. This lever here is called the maintaining weight. Now, if I lift the maintaining weight, that maintaining weight, if you look closely at it, is dropping down with every tick. That maintaining weight is providing an extra weight to keep the clock going. So that means that I can rather nicely get my winding handle and put it on here and wind in the knowledge that that maintaining weight is going to keep the clock going. So I'm winding and the uh, clock is still going, it's not losing any time whatsoever. Now one of the things you might um, be wondering is, you know, I'm doing this one-handed now because this is the lightest of all of the weights. Have a look at that, of that weight up there, the one that's just sitting there, down there. I'll wind it up. Look how small it is. So I've talked about winding. I've talked about the weights. I've talked about, um, oh, so you can see that maintaining weight. I have on its way down. And when it finishes, it'll just land on that ledge there. So I can, I can leave it there. I could actually, if I want to be kind to it, probably should, I can unclip that maintaining weight and drop it down. So now everything's back to normal. One of the things that we need to think about is about regulating the clock. And I'm going to show you by sharing screen again. Um, what we'll see. Oh, here we go, eight o'clock. What, well, eight o'clock? I've just made the clock strike eight and then 10. So that means it's what's the average of eight and 10, it's struck nine. Anyway, I can do whatever I like really by ringing these bells. Uh, so that was eight o'clock, um, which I don't know why it is that it always takes me by surprise when these, these things happen. But anyway, let me go back to, the, um, to tell you about the website. If I go to the website, which is with any luck now um, on the screen, you will see that the clock is currently 10.05 seconds ahead. And the reason for that is, well, I haven't been able to come up to the clock um, during the recent, uh, the recent weeks. Um, if you look, if I scroll down, you'll find the a diary at the bottom. Last Monday, the clock was wound by Chloe, Caron and Jessica Finson, Alessa Weiler, Chloe Caron, Jessica Finson, John Aldridge, Kazuo Newcomb, John Aldridge, Kazuo Newcomb. It's been a while since I've been up here. Um, so, um, but it's not bad. It was last regulated. What I can do is I can go to graphs over here on the left side and I can look at how has the clock drifted with temperature and let me go back to 2020, sometime in December, let's say, uh, let's do 12th of December. And you'll see if I click on go on that, and you can mess around with this as much as you like. 
that the, um, the drift of the clock, well, that little blue arrow on the top left was the last time the clock was regulated. And it was going nicely kind of gently down. And then when the weather got cold, look at the temperature graph on the bottom, it started really messing around. And it's been cold, as you know, on and off, um, really since um, shortly after Christmas. So I don't think the clock is coping very well with the hard cold. And I'm reluctant to do anything about this, but I think I will because I don't like the clock being 10 seconds ahead. So um, what will we do? Let's just do one day summary. Hold on. One day, 30 day summary. Okay. So that's the last 30 days. You can see that the clock has been drifting ahead. This is thing called the going, which is how much does it gain per day? It's currently gaining about 230 milliseconds per day. That's 0.2 seconds a day. That's about 1.4 seconds a week. That's pretty good. But for this clock, it's, it's not great. So what I'm going to do now is to show you how I can slow the clock down by, well, let's slow it down by 0.2 seconds per day, 200 milliseconds per day. I'm also going to get rid of this 10 seconds offset. I'm going to stop the clock for, I'll stop it for about nine seconds. I have to stop it for multiples of three because that's the swinging period of the pendulum. Right, so let me show you all of that. I'm going to firstly show you my regulation weights. Now down here is a lovely box. And in this box is a set of weights. And these weights are my regulation weights. And I'm going to put those weights onto a platform. There's the pendulum in this case here. Put the case here because of the um, air currents that come up from the room below. Oh, it's a bit tight. Oh, I can't undo that. Hold on, I have to put the camera, the camera down. So there we go, I've opened the case. And you'll see on the pendulum uh, is a platform where I can put some regulation weights. And you'll see there are some weights on there already. Now, if I want to slow the clock down by 200 milliseconds per day, then, well, these are my weights. This weight here would slow the clock down by 10 seconds a day. This weight here would slow the clock down by, um, I've got some light on there. That would slow the clock down by one second a day. This weight here would slow the clock down by 0.1 seconds a day. This little weight here would slow the clock down by 0.01 seconds a day. So that's 10 milliseconds a day. That's 100. So I want to, well, if I put those weights on, it speeds the clock up. If I take the weights off, it slows them down. So I want to take off 200 milliseconds per day. So I need to take off, uh, let's see what I've got on there. I need to take off 200. And I think I can see one there. I think that's what I need to take off there. So I'm going to take that off. There we are. That weight there will slow the clock down by 200 milliseconds per day. Put that safely onto my pile of weights. Now, we will see over the next few days whether that's really made any difference. The other thing I want to do, though, which I said I wanted to do, was to stop the clock so that it's not 10 seconds ahead. So to do that, I'm going to put my finger in the works. I'll stop it for nine seconds. I'm going to put my finger in the works. Um, all right. Uh, 
that, I think I stopped it for nine seconds. Um, now, actually, it doesn't affect anything at all, except people listening out there would notice that it's um, uh, nine seconds. There's no longer 10 seconds ahead. Fine. What else will I tell you? Um, firstly, I've noticed that my phone is telling me that my battery is about to give up. So I, that's why I've got a spare phone over there. So I'm now going to change phones. Um, oh, technology. Now this one's decided to reconnect. Never mind. Let me tell you um, what I was going to tell you. I was going to tell you about the instrumentation for the clock. About um, whoa, when I took over looking after the clock, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, I, got a, I had a student who was very um, keen on uh, websites and instrumentation, a fourth year engineering student, um, a chap called Rick Lupton. And he's the guy who set up all the instrumentation that we've got um, in the... Um, in the clock and I'm very pleased to say that Rick has been fantastic um, and um, the, web, the instrumentation that he set up way back then is still running brilliantly well. We've shifted everything so that it runs on Raspberry Pis. Those of you who know about Raspberry Pis will know that they're really quite good fun and um, I'm going to show you where all the Raspberry Pis are. I don't know, Paul, whether you can see this camera. Over here, behind this door, I've got my little set of instrumentation. There's a Raspberry Pi, and there's another Raspberry Pi there, and I've got another Raspberry Pi down there, and another Raspberry Pi up there. So none of these Raspberry Pis, none of these, this electronics is doing anything to make the clock any better. It's just so that we can measure stuff. And those of you who are interested can go to the website and you can just see all the things that we can measure. Um, and that's, uh, that's been a lot of fun. Right, I want to wind up now, so that uh, that wasn't meant to be a joke. I want to um, tell you just about the Great Court Run, because that's something that I know that people have been interested in over the years. So I'm just going to share my screen one last time. It, it does seem like um, a bit a long time ago since we last did this, but the Great Court Run meant actually assembling in a crowd outside in the sunshine, um, are running around Great Court in the time it takes for the clock to strike 12. Well, the question is, when is the best time of the, of the week or of the year to run the Great Court run? So here is some statistics. The Great Court run takes some, something between 40, that takes somewhere between 46 and 50 seconds for the clock to strike 12. Now, it, it, there are funny distributions. The, the sort of brownish colour is what I call on the upper layer and the bluish colour is on the lower layer. What do I mean by that? So if you go back to my other phone, the one I'm holding, you will see that the winding mechanism, whoops, I think I have to unshare, the winding mechanism has the cable on two layers. Do you see the cable which you wind up has on two layers? When the cable is on the upper layer, it's got more leverage, it's got a bigger torque. And that means that the bells run faster when they're on the cables on the upper layer. And when it's on the lower layer, it runs slower. 
So that's quite neat. So if I go back to my sharing screen, you will see that the upper layer has a lower, shorter, uh, uh, shorter time than the lower layer. So first thing is, if the clock is wound, if you want to run the, run the clock on a Saturday, make sure the clock has been wound a few days before, it'll go fast, it'll, take, it'll be a better time. And the next thing is, which is really interesting as well, is that the, the cable itself has a weight. And so as the weights go down the seven meters down the length of the tower, the height of the tower, the weight of the cable matters. So that gives you the slope on these curves. So first thing is make sure it's wound two and a half days before your last wind. And then do the run straight away because that's when there's less weight of the cable down the tower. But the next thing that's really important is weather. Oh, here we go, quarter past. Next thing is weather. It turns out that if you plot stuff on uh, an air density graph, and that's to do with temperature and pressure, then everything correlates really well. So the easiest um, time to do the Great Court Run is on a cold, dry day, three days after winding. And really, that gives you an extra four seconds to get around Great Court compared with doing it on a warm, humid day immediately after winding. So there's a message there. Well, I think there's any number of things I could tell you about the, uh, the clock, but I think um, it's probably time I said uh, thank you very much for listening and open the floor up for questions. And I'm sure Paul will be excellent at managing that process. So uh, thank you very much for listening. I, I suggest people unmute themselves. I can't make them unmute. I suggest people unmute themselves and be disciplined about muting themselves after they've asked the question. That's perfect. All right, so if I might start, if no one else wants to go ahead. Ask a question. Uh, can... First of all, brilliant. I absolutely loved the tour. It was it was great, fascinating to to see this uh, brilliant presentation. Um, so what I was wondering, um, the weights that you that you wound up with the lever, do they determine the speed of um, of the strikes or of the clock? So let's say you would change the weight, you would change the weights with the, the clock or the the chimes run at a different speed. So that's a very good question. So let me just tell you a little bit about that. And I don't know. Uh, there we go. Is that camera? That camera working all right? Yes. So. The weights up there for the, um, there's four weights up there. There's one for the, uh, the quarters, one for the St. John strike, one for the Trinity strike, and one for the going. The three lots for the bells, yes, if you made those ones heavier, then everything would go faster. So you're absolutely right. The weights make the bells ring faster if you make them heavier. But the one that doesn't make any difference at all, is the one for the going, the littlest weight. And that's because of this very clever escapement. It's called the double three-legged gravity escapement. And that's that pair of lozenge shaped things here. And it turns out, well, this was invented in the 1830s, 1840s, especially for the clock at Westminster, the one where Big Ben is. Um, now, I could explain how the double three-legged gravity escapement works, but if you go to that website, you'll see a lovely animation of the double three-legged gravity escapement. So the answer to your question is that, yes, the weights will make the bells go faster, but it definitely does nothing at all to making the clock go faster. So the clock is governed very carefully by this escapement and by the pendulum. Is that, is that answer your question? Yeah, definitely. Thanks a lot. Okay, other questions? Thank you very much for the talk. Very informative about the clock. Um, I know it's not quite connected, but what's in all those box files behind you? 
Oh, well, which, which, oh, okay. <laughs> well, I'm not sure what I should show you. Well, firstly, the simple one here is there are box files over, over here, which are, um, some people will know what MV stands for. MV stands for men's voices. And these are all the, um, this is the music uh, from when the choir was men's voices only. Uh, when Richard Marlowe first arrived, it was men only. Uh, but then when the college admitted women, uh, we had went to having a mixed choir. So those are those ones. Uh, various other things include um, some junk that's lying around. These are various folders, files, that have just been put up here for storage. And some of them are extremely dull. Uh, faculty board and minutes. Um, anyway, that's all they are. It's, it, what happens up here is that it becomes a bit of a, a dumping ground for things. Um, there we go. There are some Latin dictionaries. There are some, oh well, there's various things. Does that help? Yes, lovely. Thank you very much. Hi, hi, Hugh. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, Matt. Uh, Matt Feast. Um, thank you so much for a really um, entertaining talk. I thought that was fantastic, and I, I never realised there was so much um, behind the clock. Um, a couple of questions, actually. One was just going to be: a, Has the clock ever been in a situation where it has um, hasn't been wound, and and what happened in that circumstance? Oh. And then the other was also. I noticed on the website it um, talks about silencing the clock for certain times during college. I mm. uh, just wondering if you could talk through the process of that and what circumstances it would need to be silenced for. Okay, so the first uh, one is about forgetting to, about the, does the clock ever stop? Um, the first thing to, to say is that on the last Saturday of March and the last Saturday of October, there's the clock change. So we have to go from uh, winter time to summer time and summer time to winter time. So I have to stop the clock then um, to advance the clock or to, to, to put it back an hour. Um, and actually, that's a very good time to do clock maintenance. So you might find around that time that the clock actually will be, will might be stopped for, for the whole of Saturday or something just to get a few things done. Um, so that's the first thing. Second thing is, uh, yes, it's. Um, I've, I've, I have several times had phone calls at odd times of day or night when the portals will phone up saying the clock has stopped. Ah, oh, bugger, I forgot to wind the clock. And it's really annoying because the clock stops, but it doesn't stop at the same time as the bell's stopping. Which means that when the clock stops, all the bells are... So the clock might stop at, at 20 past four, but the bells stopped at quarter to 11, and the quarters stopped at... Oh, it's just a, a job to do it. But it is quite fun. It's like, you know, it's, it's like... Well, anyway, it's one of those things. So I've been very pleased that um, uh, Chloe, Jessica, Alessa, and um, John, and... Kazuo um, have been brilliant over the the pre the clock hasn't stopped since well the last time was the clock change in October so uh, that's been great um, now the business about silencing the bells well that's pretty interesting one actually have you noticed that the clock is silent from just after midnight till seven it's silent, it does midnight, and then it's silent until 7.15 in the morning. Now, there was a, um, uh, a college, um, the college council did a survey of fellows in 1935 to decide whether it should silence the bells. And the survey is quite interesting. If I, I can dig it out if you like. The survey had um, all sorts of um, people uh, names recorded like Wittgenstein and G.I. Taylor and uh, um, very magnificent names. Um, 
And some of them were very indignant. They said, of course, the bell shouldn't, shouldn't be allowed to stop. You know, it's, and other, others were saying, well, I don't live in college, so it doesn't make any difference to me. Um, anyway, all, all very interesting. But it was decided to silence the bells. And let me show you how that's done. So I need to go back to my handheld again. And the way it works is that the, there's a wheel here, and that wheel... Hugh, you need to turn it round. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, there's a wheel. There's a wheel here, and that wheel goes around once in 24 hours. And there's a cam on it here, and that cam pushes this lever, and that lever pushes this lever, and that lever causes the, the bell levers to be moved out the way. So the hours go silent, but actually the mechanism still turns. And the reason for that is you still have to count the hours in sequence. You do one, and then two, and then three, and then four. So if you silence after midnight, and to be able to restart at, at um, seven o'clock, you have to have kept on counting. Um, and um, the quarters are silenced by this wheel here, and this wheel advances every, uh, uh, it's, again, it's, got, it's got 24 um, holes in it, and it's got these pins here, these are the, the times when it's silent, so there's seven hours worth of silencing on those. Now, you can tell that it was not designed like that originally, because you notice that all of this silencing stuff is on the outside of the frame. And just like that everything for your car is inside the car under the bonnet, you don't have bits of engine on the outside, in exactly the same way as this clock would not have had anything on the front, especially not in front of the John Smith of Derby um, uh, nameplate. So all of that silencing mechanism stuff is on the outside, which kind of tells you that was an add-on. Now, when do we silence it other than midnight till 7 o'clock in the morning? And the only time, really, is when the choir is doing rec recordings. So I will get a, an email saying, well, the choir is recording over the, over the weekend. Could we please silence it? At which point, I will let um, uh, Chloe or Alessa or Kazuo uh, do the silencing, because it usually means silencing at rather annoying times of day and night. So, um, uh, and to do that, well, basically, um, it's essentially forcing this lever to stay moved and forcing this lever to stay in place. Um, it's not too difficult to silence it, but the one thing that, that we have to do is to remember to unsilence it, and that's something that I quite often forget as well, and that leads to another phone call from the porters. Good question. Thank you for that one. Any other questions? Don't hold back. I'm here now. I may as well can, can deal with anything, really, more or less. I was going to ask another one here, if, if no one else has got yeah, one. Yeah, go I'm for really, it. I was curious, is, um, you mentioned that the computers are not helping the clock at the moment. Do you think there'll ever be a time when Trinity does go digital? Oh, that's a good, uh, that's a good thought. I... Um, over the years, uh, we've had letters from uh, clock companies uh, saying, um, look, we can uh, put automatic winding on for you. And basically what, what, what automatic winding does is that, uh, well, you get rid of all the weights, you get rid of all this stuff, and it, you connect your clock essentially to the internet. And it's still a mechanical clock, but it's, it's, um, it's governed by the internet. Um, we've resisted this, and I'm extremely glad we have, because most of the clocks around the country that have been, that have had automatic winding, 
uh, put in, um, it hasn't been without problems. Um, and I'm very glad that um, we've got manual winding. I think the number one thing about manual winding is that once a week, somebody has to come up here and have a look and just check that there isn't a, a, a cat stuck in the, in, the, uh, in the gear somewhere or, or that, you know, that, and I just think it's, it's good. And also I think as well that over the years, it's not that big a, a job to do it, but such an interesting clock. Um, and um, I've just found it to be a great pleasure. So the last, I just can't imagine not being able to find somebody who's willing to wind it. Oh, here we go. More bells. That's half past. Um, so, well, maybe it'll happen, but I hope not. What else? Any other questions? Hugh, how does um, movement of the clock tower affect the working of the mechanism? Ah, oh, well, look. Um, so, it's something that's really, um, really bothered me over the over the years. As to, I mean, I know that the clock is is running well. You know, a few seconds a month is fantastic. But I have noticed, and you can have a look on the website, have a look at plotting um, uh, um, going of the clock versus tilt of the tower. And you think, what on earth would cause the tower to tilt? And it turns out, at least this is the theory, that when the sun shines on the south-facing wall of the tower, that you get thermal expansion and the, um, the, the sunny warm side um, facing the sun um, expands and the cold side facing St. John's um, doesn't expand. Um, and that causes like a bimetallic strip, it causes the tower to tilt over. So we put in some instrumentation to look at how the tilt of the tower affects the twist of the pendulum. So I won't do it now, but if you go onto the website and plot tilt versus twist, it's just astonishing at how the tiny micro radians of tilt of the tower and micro radians of twist of the pendulum are perfectly correlated and that these are linked to the clock speeding up and slowing down. Um, it's not something we need to fix. But it's really interesting that the instrumentation that we've got enables us to see um, uh, the effects that the clockmakers of the 19th century who built this clock would not have never been aware of at all. Um, and uh, it's really nice measure, measuring things for the sake of it. It's not that we need to make the clock any better, but it's just to understand all the little, the little tweaks. Thanks, you. Thank you. Other questions? I ought to show you the, I said that there were three clocks. The first clock, 1610. Um, the only, um, uh, I think the only bits we've got from that are up on the roof is the 1610 bell. So that's original. And possibly a few of the um, levers and things are original. But of the 1723 clock, um, the dial is still there, the big one on the outside, but nothing else, nothing of that seems to remain. I don't know what happened to it, except for one thing, which is this, um, um, I don't know whether you can see that, that's the one thing, is the, this was the, um, from the clock, is basically the second hand or the minute hand dial from inside the clock. Thomas Stubbs of London, 1726. Um, it's funny how something can just disappear without trace. What other questions are there? Very happy to answer any questions. 
Hi Hugh, I have a question. Yeah. It's Jess. Um, how do you put the clock forward and back? Ah, uh, well, putting the clock, putting the clock um, uh, forward is relatively easy because um, all I have to do is to unclip the escapement and let the clock run fast. Um, I can put the clock forward an hour and that takes maybe five minutes to do. Um, so that means that the march putting forward process is a little bit, um, is a little bit of a sort of quick thing, bit of a formality. But in October, to put the clock back an hour, you can't, you can't run a clock backwards. So there's two choices. One is to put the clock forward 23 hours. And some of you might remember in October that because we were locked down, um, we gathered out on Great Court and we did put the clock forward 23 hours. It took about half an hour to do it. Um, and we saw the hands whizzing around fast. Um, but normally what I would do is just stop the clock, literally stop the clock for one hour. And the nice thing about that is if you do it at midnight, um, well, you can come up here with a, with a few friends and a couple of bottles of wine and some cheese. Um, and that's not a bad way to spend midnight in an October dark October night. That does sound fun. Thank you. It's been great, by the way, that so many people have turned up to listen to this. I think we we're up to about 70 or 80 at, at one stage, which is brilliant. And um, it's um, nice to, nice to uh, see that there's an interest. So, um, well, look, I'm very happy if, uh, unless there are any other questions. Um, I think Paul has been... Um, recording this, um, oh, what's happened there? Oh, I'll turn that around that way. I think Paul has been recording this, um, uh, this, um, uh, this session, so we might uh, find a place to, to put it on a website somewhere, um, and um, we can have a look at this at our leisure. So firstly, I would like to thank um, uh, Olga and John for inviting me to, to give this uh, uh, tour for the chapel. Um, and secondly, I would very much like to thank Paul Ashley, who's been doing all the tech stuff behind the scenes. Um, and thank you very much and look forward very much to seeing you all face to face one day soon in college. <laughs>